Hey, what's up, you guys? So, um, you guys can talk back. What's up, you guys? Woo! Nice. That was cool. So, uh, I'm Brent. Um, I'm a senior pastor at uh, Harvest Church. We went uh, rogue. We're a vertical church now. We're not called Harvest Bible Chapel, but we're still in the same fam. That's all branded in the same fellowship, so no one has to be alarmed. Like, you look scared right now. We're fine. We're totally still following Jesus. Everything is uh, so, so legit. Um, thank you for letting me be here uh, and also my wife. Um, you guys are one of the most beautiful congregations I've ever seen, mainly because my wife is here. Uh, but you all are kind of good looking too. You know, Jesus did some good work here. Uh, but at least why don't you just stand up and say hi to everybody so everyone can just see you and you can see people. Turn around there. Yeah. Hi. Okay, so she's really special. We also have like uh, four kids. They're not as special. Everyone with kids knows that. Um, but we've got two girls, two boys, Mariah, 21, Nathan, 19. Uh, pray for him. He's trying to figure out direction in life, hoping he goes to Moody. Uh, that's my hope for him, but we'll see what God wants for him. And then uh, Seth, 17, and um, Ainsley, uh, 14, going to be 15 really soon. Uh, kind of a cool, uh, kind of full circle-ish kind of a thing, but... So I was here uh, years back, four, five, probably six years ago. My son, Seth, had a baseball tournament in Des Moines. You guys play a lot of baseball out here. So he was at one of the really cool parks around here. And it was that same time during that tournament that I was at like Becky Tank's mom's basement. You guys know Becky Tank or her mom or anything like that? And I was meeting with a few people who are going to want to start this church. So our church loves your church because we helped to kind of begin it in the, uh, it's redundant, but in the beginning. So we love you guys, and you guys are awesome, and we love to see what God's doing here. It's been fun working with Ryan a little bit here lately, and John Cochran from Harvest and Davenport to uh, just, you know, continue to see what God's doing here. God's doing some amazing things. And so Jeremy Wallen right here, he's another special guy. Everyone know Jeremy? Say like, what's up? Yeah, yeah. And Heather. Yeah. Dude, like, they really like you. No one clapped for my wife. But Jeremy's like, yeah, everyone loves Jeremy. So um, uh, they used to go to our church. So that's not what, only, the only thing that makes them cool, but that helps. And then, and then the other special person here, I'm going to embarrass her, it's Tawny. Because, yeah, see, yeah, because she came to our church once. And, and she's like, I know you. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. And so I wanted to apologize just publicly for not remembering. But now I, I totally know now. So we're all good. All right, so. Since we are a Harvest Church and Ryan probably preaches from the Bible, I'm just guessing, right? Let's do that. So we're going to be in Nehemiah mostly, uh, but we're going to start out in Ezra. Okay, so the title of the message, the point of the message is praying when all seems lost. And we're going to see how Nehemiah just kind of gives us some help. Like when life is, when we're lost in life, some Bibles are coming around, just raise your hand if you need a Bible. We'd love to give you a Bible and uh, maybe even here uh, you can keep it. I don't know, or just take it home. It's all good. Um, that's not the worst thing to steal, would be a Bible, right? I mean, like, God would use that, man. That'd be awesome. All right, so um, what's happening is, is sometimes we feel lost in life, like circumstances are lost, uh, discombobulated, dark, confusing. What do we do when things kind of have fallen apart a little bit, or all the pieces haven't come together, or we just feel like all kind of seems lost? Now, Nehemiah was going through that. We're going to find that out because the, the walls around Jerusalem were not rebuilt yet around Judah, and so we want to kind of understand what happened here and how God used Nehemiah, but first, you got to understand that Israel was kind of going up and down, all right, because they weren't always very faithful. Anybody relate to that? Like, they were not always faithful. If you look at the book of Judges, you find out that Israel was like up and down constantly. They would kind of obey God, and then they would be flourishing, and then they wouldn't obey God, then God would allow like another nation to come and like grab them, and then it was just up and down in Judges, up and down, up and down, and, and we still see that with Israel, so we, we see now here in, in the Old Testament at this point in Ezra and Nehemiah that Israel was in exile in Babylon and yet God was promising that they would go back to where they're supposed to be and worship him and continue to follow him and rebuild. And so what's happening is God is working through this king Cyrus in Persia and saying now is the time. And so I want you to see how the first wave of people were going from Babylon back to Judah, and God uses this pagan king Cyrus to make this happen. God uses everybody. God uses everybody, which is so cool. Just a like, guy can use you. 
which just doesn't seem like possible, but it is. Like God wants to use you. God will use whoever he wants in this church or in this community for his purposes. And we're gonna see here in Ezra that God uses this King Cyrus so that the first wave of people would go back to Judah. But then Nehemiah takes the third wave of people back to Judah to rebuild the walls, but here they're gonna rebuild the temple in the first thing. So let's just read this really quick in Ezra and then we're gonna go to Nehemiah. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, prophet, cool, uh, connection here, might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So he's stirring up this king and because uh, God's ready to work. When, when God, God's always working, but when God's ready to kind of put the pieces back together again, he works fast. When it's Because I know it seems slow, waiting is hard. Don't like to wait in traffic. Don't like to wait in the drive through line. Don't like, we, had, we went to Texas Roadhouse last night. We love that place. We had to wait for 50 or 60 minutes. We ain't doing that, so we left. We went to Ruby Tuesday, all right? Because we don't want to wait for 50 or 60 minutes. Like, all of Des Moines was there last night. Um, are there only two restaurants in Des Moines, like Texas Roadhouse and Ruby Tuesday? No, there aren't, right? But Ruby Tuesdays was good. And so we didn't want to wait. But waiting is hard. But when God is ready to put the pieces back together again, I'm telling you, he works fast. And so here he is, he's stirring up this king. He raised up this king so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, which is really cool. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And, and just note really quickly, so not everyone wanted to go back. They were kind of comfy where they were. So be careful of that. Be careful of that. While you're waiting, don't get too comfortable where you are um, because God is going to eventually do something and you don't want to stay where you are. You want to move forward as he is moving you forward. So that's really, really important. Now, it's not, it's not here right now that we're reading this, but you just, I just want you to know that. Not everyone went, and uh, we, we want to go when God calls us to go, right? So, and so it says, let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So let all the good stuff go because God um, is to be honored and we're to give him our best, right? So now we get to Nehemiah. So now in Nehemiah, we have this guy who is gonna take the third wave of people to Judah. Nehemiah's a pretty cool guy. First of all, the name's amazing. All right, I don't know too many Nehemiahs, um, but, but if you're gonna be a cupbearer to the king, which he is, this is right there at the end of chapter one, you probably have some pretty good character. You probably could be like trustworthy. Uh, it's not the greatest job in the world because if the wine is poison, what the cupbearer does is he is drinking the wine before the king drinks it because he's like the stopgap because if someone's trying to kill the king, which people want to do that sometimes, right? You t take out the leader guy. Uh, what would happen if the uh, wine was poisoned? Who drinks a lot of wine here? I can tell, I could just see a couple of people probably do. No, you guys don't want to say it. No one wants to say it in church. Okay, that's fine. But uh, I did see a hand go up. I'm not going to point to where it was, but I thought I just saw like a, like a thing go like this. Like, I'm going to do it. I don't drink wine. So um, what happens if you drink the wine and it's poison? What's going to happen to you? I like you. What do you what, what, what? You're going to die. So not a great job, but you have to be trustworthy. And Nehemiah was. And so we're going to see even more like, like how that really kind of like plays itself out here. The fact that Nehemiah was a man of character. And so just let's read in verse 1. It says, the words of Nehemiah. Uh, we don't really know who wrote Nehemiah. It could have been Nehemiah. It could have been Ezra. Uh, certainly a part of it was written by Nehemiah. But he's the son of Hakaliah. So he's got this dad named Hakaliah. And uh, now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the capital that Hanani, one of my brothers, so he's got this brother named Hanani who was in Judah, but then has come back. And uh, so he's coming back with certain men from Judah. So just, just guys that were there and, and rebuilding. And it seems like, like nothing's pro progressing the way it needs to be. So Hanani goes back to let Nehemiah know about what's happening here. Now, Nehemiah had a heart for his people, which is really cool. I don't know what you have a heart for nowadays. Obviously, as a church, you have a heart for Utah. That's awesome. Uh, because there's a lot of like people who are called Mormons in Utah and they don't really worship the one true God or Jesus. And so how amazing would it be if you guys play a part in people in Utah coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That would be amazing. 
So you have Utah on your hearts. Nehemiah obviously had Judah on his heart. And, and, and now some news comes to him. And it's not the greatest news. Um, let's just right, be honest here. And he says, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And shame is really a, a powerful kind of uh, thing to experience and, and not great. Um, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So not great news, but there it is, right? Just very transparent. And then, then he says in verse four, as soon as I heard these words, so bad news affected by it, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days um, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, so very, he just cares so much, not a great update. And so of course this is gonna affect you. Things affect you. You, you might have been affected by something this morning. Maybe something your kids did in the minivan on the way here. A lot of bad things happen in minivans on the way to church. True or false, right? A lot of bad things. So right now, you might be affected. Just, just forget that for the moment, and God wants to speak to you here a little bit through his word. So forget your kids, but you might be affected this week in some way. Maybe, maybe you got bad news, and, and, and as, as you hear the title, When All Seems Lost, maybe you're like, oh yeah, that's all too familiar to me right now. Things do seem lost. I don't know which direction I'm headed in. The circumstances are hard right now. My life seems lost. So Nehemiah, of course, feels this. Why wouldn't you feel that? And so he's praying, he's fasting before the God of heaven. And then he said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night before the people of Israel, your servants, consistency, persistence, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, being very transparent here, very obvious um, uh, and real, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. Which is interesting because I just said that Nehemiah obviously would have been a very trustworthy guy. His character would have been awesome. You know, fairly pristine, not perfect, obviously, but if you're going to be the cupbearer of the king, and yet he's just like, dude, this is my fault too. So, interesting, we're going to get back to that. So even I have sin in my, my father's house and all that. We have acted very corruptly against you um, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. And now Moses is in here a little bit. There's such a great thread in the Christian world. We've got Jeremiah in here. we got Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, contemporaries. Uh, Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. That's cool. That's just trivia for you guys. Now, here's the cool thing, though. Because, like, if you're in religious circles, like, if you're on a baseball team, you want to kind of be like, if you're in the infield, what position do you want to be? Kind of. <laughs> I wanted to be nice there. Just uh, kind of. Cool, almost. You want to be, be a shortstop, don't you? Because, like, like, that's the cool position. Um, and if you're in religious circles, do you want to be a priest? You do, especially back in these days. So Ezra's a priest, and then the other thing you'd want to be in religious circles back then is, what's Malachi? He's not a priest, but what is he? He's a prophet. So a priest represents the people before to God, and a prophet represents God to the people. That's awesome. But then here's little Nehemiah, a little cupbearer. I'm going to exaggerate this, right? Because I don't... I don't I, I mean, I'm not a priest, I'm a, I'm a pastor, I'm just, I'm really just, I'm in your area too, right? I'm not like this high priest or anything, although I am high up here, which is cool. Well, we're separated. But it's just little Nehemiah. Do you ever think you're too small to make an impact? You're not. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, he's Nehemiah, a cupbearer to the king, and God is going to phenomenally use him for his glory. So you have to know that God's going to use you for your glory, for, not for your glory, <laughs> Don't always speak exactly the way I want to speak. For God's glory. And that's an awesome thing. So he's now talking to the Lord. Oh, Lord God of heavens, of the heavens, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love going through all this. And he's saying that he's, he's confessing his sins, kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Uh, the name of the Lord, his character, his attributes. We were singing about the name of the Lord. Um, love, love that. Some incredible worship this morning. They are your servants and your people. 
um, you know that, that you are his, right? Just don't, don't take that for granted. You woke up today and you were still his if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And do you think he knows how to be a papa? Pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, the gospel is all about adoption. So we've got a family in our church that, it, um, that that's the, the, they've, they've never been parents before. Um, when they first came to our church, um, they came down. And I was like, oh, man, cool couple, young couple. And she, you know, um, she, she kind of looks like Carrie Underwood a little bit, just blonde. I'm, just, I'm thinking like stereotypically, I'm like, she must be a teacher or something cool like that, the way she kind of looks. And I'm like, so what do you do? And she's like, oh, I fought in Afghanistan. My mouth is like, eh, dropping. Like, you got to be kidding me. Like, you fought in Afghanistan. So she did, and she never wanted to be a mom. So she loses her job, and uh, just, just all has just happened, and she's kind of freaking out. I lost my job, and then all of a sudden, that same week, she gets a text from her husband's aunt as her sweet little girls that need to be adopted, and would you guys think about this? She's like, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way, but God's like, yes way, and so things have been changing, and now they're going to adopt, and so the cool thing about the gospel and adoption is this. Adoption is basically, you're not mine. Because this is what God, like, we're not born children of God. Horrible theology, ridiculous theology. We don't teach that at Harvest because that's not true. That's just make you feel good, Oprah theology, okay? You know, we're not all children of God uh, because we're sinners and we need Jesus Christ. But the gospel is, you're not mine, you're not mine, you're not mine, but I want you to be mine. I mean, isn't that, isn't that amazing? That's awesome. And, and so we are his people because he wants us to be his people or his servants whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. This is a good dad. He's, this is a really good dad. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success. It's not a bad thing, it's favor. To your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And then, of course, just like this is just setting it up. Like if you're a movie person uh, or if you're a book person, it's like just now I was a cupbearer to the, to the king. I mean, it just seems so abrupt. Why are you there? It's because it's setting up. Like, like Nehemiah was where he was supposed to be. It's not always like clear why we are where we are. And yet God's like, it's clear to me. Like it's totally clear to me. Just trust me. And so here's Nehemiah, right, where he's supposed to be. Now, I'm not, he was the cupbearer to the king. Now, do you think that's a pretty strategic position to be in? It is, because the king's got some resources. Nehemiah needs resources to go rebuild the walls. So read the rest of the story. I'm not going through the whole book. I'm just doing chapter one. But read the, next, the, the rest of the story. Like, throughout this week, you're going to be blown away by it. There's some amazing stuff in Nehemiah, especially if you love, like, revival-ish kind of stuff, and especially if you love leadership. There's some amazing principles here in Nehemiah. So let's pick this apart. Here's the thing. So when, when all seems lost, I want you to see this progression. First of all, this. You get bad news. Nehemiah got bad news. You guys remember what the bad news was? There is opposition. We know later on there's division. We know that the walls are crumbling. They're tumbling. They are not up yet. Nehemiah loves his people. There's a problem. So Nehemiah hears the news, and here's what he does. He accepts it. Not easy to do. But here's a problem. I'm going to accept the problem. When there is a problem, I want you to accept it. I want you to accept it factually. I want you to see it. I want you to face it. I don't want you to explain it away. I've seen this sometimes. I'm not picking on the moms. I've just seen this for whatever reason with moms a lot. And, and let's say there's a problem with their children, like, like teenage children are rebellious and things like that. And you kind of sometimes see like a, we're not going to face it necessarily, or sometimes we're going to ex maybe explain it away a little bit. And, and dads do that too, though, right? I'm a dad. I have four kids. Teenagers are not easy to raise. Uh, more sanctifying almost probably than marriage. Uh, parenting is hard. But what will happen that we'll see, though, is, is we don't want to explain away things, okay? So if your kid's rebellious, and uh, they, I, I got a good buddy of mine, good buddy of mine, uh, whose son um, got drunk in his school locker room during school. Not the proudest moment, and he's, uh, this guy's a pastor. Not the proudest moment as a parent or a pastor. But you have to face it. You don't just explain it away. And, and so we have to understand that factually, let's see it, but we don't need to add to it, though, with all this emotional garbage. Now, I'm, 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 you're like, oh, man, that's, that's harsh, man. No, I'm going to get to the emotional stuff in a minute. It's going to be good for us to be able to process this. 
But what I'm saying is, if we bring the emotional in with the factual, what we do is we add kind of like this pen that has the ink of anxiety and fear. And do you know what we write with that pen? We write all these things that the facts were not presenting to us. But we just interject because of our emotion and add to the problem. You don't do that. That's why gossip is ridiculously not godly. Because gossip is making more of a problem than we're supposed to. Because gossip is always adding to something. Because is gossip rarely um, true? Yeah, right. I don't know if I said that right. I think I confused myself. But I think you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Gossip is not always accurate. And mostly it's not. And so now what we've done is we've caused everyone to panic because there's something that seems really big and it's really not as big as it seems. Now, this was big, but it's something that God is allowing, something that God is doing, and it's big enough as it is. Don't make it more of a problem. But the thing that Nehemiah did not do was all of a sudden just like panic and where he would be just going saying and and going, oh my gosh, maybe God doesn't have a plan for Israel now. Here's evidence. That's That's not what God is saying. Or maybe Jesus isn't going to come through Israel. Maybe Jesus won't be the Savior now because everything is a mess. Maybe my family won't be strong now. Maybe maybe my career won't go in the direction that it seems like God had been putting on my heart for years. Maybe our financial situation will never get better, right? Because we see a problem. And the emotions, though, can add to it. But we got to keep just the facts. The facts are this. There's some opposition that happens, does that not happen in the Christian life? If it didn't, we would, we would, the Bible wouldn't even be true because we have a real live enemy. The enemy's name is, you guys go, this is your turn. Thank you. You guys knew that because it's real. And if you're a Christian, if you're standing for Jesus, someone hates it because someone hates Jesus and because someone hates Jesus really, 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 really bad, we're hated too. You're hated because Jesus is in you, okay? So... Um, uh, Nehemiah is, is, is not exaggerating, though, the problem. But the problem by itself is pretty bad, and all of us have experienced that. And, 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 but we don't want to add to it because, like, we, we, we do this sometimes with moles. You do this with moles. A mole, it's, not, it's not a really fun thing to talk about, moles, but we have it on our bodies sometimes. And, and hair grows on moles. That's gross. And moles grow in places you don't want them to grow. And as you get older... You know, you see more moles. And, and, you, and as you grow, weird things grow in different weird places. And I'm going to stop there because I'm getting sick. Um, but it happens. And the, the thing is, is here's what happens when we see a mole. It's all of a sudden we turn into like oncologists and doctors and everything. And we start panicking. We're like, that's got, it's got to be cancer. It's got to be cancer. And we, we start projecting what this stuff is. And what, what's the fact? The, the fact is this. We have bodies that are, you know, so not what they're supposed to be because of sin, and things grow on them, and moles grow, and the fact is, is that that's normal, natural, even though we hate it, and then the next step would be like, well, go get it checked out. But you're not dying yet, but we do that. We, we kind of like move it forward. We have the funeral. We start grieving already. <laughs> We're like, I knew it, and yet... All that happened is just a really normal kind of growth. So we got to be careful. We got to keep things, accept the problem, but keep it factual. They're really important. But then, but then, though, here's where the emotion comes in because this is legit. Because obviously, when problems come and you face problems, you because we're human and we should be feeling kind of people. Even if you're a guy, if you're a guy here, you could feel stuff. Okay, it's 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 a problem or weird to not feel stuff. Ladies, you too, because here's what I've found lately too with some women, is that sometimes there's a lot of women that like to hide their emotions too. Ah, really? Yes. It does happen. You know why? Because we're hurt, and we don't all love to show vulnerability and be real, even ladies. Yeah. There might be some couples here, like where the man is just like constantly spitting out stuff, like, here's how I feel, and the, the woman like maybe once every seven years. And the, and the man's just like, could you, you know, right? So, but, and then uh, other way around too sometimes. So Nehemiah gets this news and of course he does what he should do. He feels the problem. Now this is an emotional thing. First one was factual. This is emotional. So he says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down 
How often, you know, how often does that happen? You get bad news, you're kind of like about ready to faint even. Sits down, he, he weeps, nothing wrong with crying, you guys. And he mourns for days. So this is really affecting him. And, th- and then I continue to fast, he says, and pray before the God of heaven. So he feels the problem. He's not exaggerating it. It's factual. But then he, emotionally, he's feeling it, which is so appropriate. And I think we have to understand a little bit better how to kind of grieve things that we lose. So because, like, we're losing things a lot. Now, I'm not talking just people, okay, which is so hard. Um, but I'm talking about we lose expectations, we lose dreams, we lose jobs, we lose, uh, how hard is it when you lose a friendship? Anybody like ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but uh, you ever lose a friendship? That's hard. Um, you ever lose a marriage? That's hard, okay? And so we grieve a lot. So I'm just gonna walk through the five stages of grief really quick because this might really bless somebody. First step is denial. And I know there's a bunch of other things that we can add and other steps maybe, but just let me give you like the historically big ones. I'm gonna add one too after I did some research uh, and maybe replace one here. Denial, this is a conscious or unconscious refusal to accept the situation at hand. That kind of goes with number one here. And that is we have to accept the, the problem. Don't exaggerate it, but accept it factually. Number two is anger. People dealing with emotional upset can be angry with themselves and or with others, especially those close to them. And I can see that. I've experienced grief. And uh, grief is weird. It is a weird thing sometimes. And, and you could be angry because you're like, this is not what I wrote up. This isn't the story. This isn't the direction. Why do we have a loss here? And you could be angry because the world is not what you thought the world should be. And, and, and anger is a good emotion to have righteously to get stuff out. And, and yet we can't hold on to it too long. And I was talking to uh, Robbie, I think, right, the camera guy in between services, and he was talking about James 1.20, and that is the righteousness of man will not, pro- or, or the, the anger of man will not produce the righteousness of God. So we, so we can't hang there forever, but it, it does help us. Like, grief is the gift that God gives us to get past stuff and to get through things. And then the third thing is bargaining. And you, you know how that goes. Is that, that's like, maybe you know someone, like, we, like, um, we have a good family. Um, my, my son, Nathan, went to Grand Canyon University, uh, for a semester, and now he, he's trying to figure out what he's trying to do, and that's why I was talking about, I hope he goes to Moody and thing. But, so he went there, and he went with a friend from his school in Minnesota, and, and the friend knew when he went, and we all knew that his dad was dying of cancer. His, his dad was a wonderful man, a Christian man, uh, a Christian counselor, uh, very gifted. And, um, you know, Hendy went because his dad wanted him to go to college, even though we knew that his dad was not gonna make it, you know, and, and so, but, you know, in, Hendy, we call him Hendy, um, in that moment before his dad died, he, he could be bargaining, Lord, you know, just please, just, I, I will go to church every Sunday. I will never swear in my brain again. I will never look at a girl a certain way or a guy. Or, I will never lust. I, we bargain. And, you know, that's part of this process. But, but I was doing some research, and the thing I want to maybe put in its place because sometimes when you, you know now that he's lost his dad he did die and you what do you bargain now but maybe maybe you bargain like lord let this never happen to my mom please i already lost a dad and you maybe but and another counselor was saying that people don't understand how much anxiety is in the process of grieving and how that almost should take the place of bargaining so you might be a lot really anxious right now don't, don't even know why but it might be that you're grieving something and you need to understand and ask the Lord to help you in that. Why am I so anxious? What am I grieving? What have I lost that I haven't come to grips yet? Then we have depression, which is reality sets in. Depression is soon to follow. Routine tasks become drudgery. Emotions are exaggerated. Do you ever get here? Maybe some of you are here right now. Apathy, lethargy. Sorry, I've been here. I've been here where, where life seems meaningless. I've been here. I don't. Life, life is hard. I, I'm, I'm afraid of what else can come. And I've been there. And it's painful. And grieving is hard. Sorrow. And then the last thing is acceptance. This is everything to do with learning to deal with the situation at hand. It's most evidence as individuals move forward and embrace life on its new terms. Although the grief stages may occur in any order, acceptance usually marks the end of the grieving process. So here's Nehemiah feeling the problem 
weeping, mourning, going before the Lord in that state of complete emotional chaos. And yet the Lord obviously is so good. So you, you have to feel, and that, but, then, but then there's this other part though too. And, and this, is, this is the third thing. It's, it's own up to the problem as well. Now, because Nehemiah does this, okay? The Bible, you know, is, is, is not easy, but it's really clear. And a lot of it is very simple. But you have to work hard to get out the meaning. But like, but this one, you don't really have to. He was obviously owning up to the problem. But the thing you need to understand, though, too, is that not every sin that you sin results in, or, or just not all the problems in your life are a result of your own sin. Because that would be crazy, if every time you sin, some massive new problem came into your life, like because you had this thought or you swore in your head at a driver, because I know you've done that, <laughs> that you immediately get into a car accident. Could you imagine that? Like a guy's like, all right, all right, you just swore at that guy in your head, you're getting into a car accident. That would be really weird. Or every time you swore or every time you had some kind of sin, a new mole popped up on your body. <laughs> We'd all be these mole people. <laughs> you know? So, so I, want you to, I, want, I don't want you to think that everything that is happening is because like, oh, I got to own up to the problem because my dad has cancer. That's something I did. You know, could you imagine Hendy doing that? Now, now, do you, do you think he, could, he can experience that? Do you think the enemy can make him want to think that? Something you did. If you were just a better son, if you just, if you just listened to your dad more, uh, you know, you, your dad wouldn't have cancer and die. Now, we, we do that stuff to ourselves. Um, condemnation wins out sometimes more often than grace. And, and in the process of grieving, too, condemnation is huge. Just condemning, condemning, condemning. But so, but what Nehemiah does though, and even though he didn't have like a personal part in being in Judah, and he's been the cupbearer to the king, is he owns up to the problem. So there, there is such a thing as personal repentance, corporate repentance. So what Nehemiah does is he's like, listen, we haven't been the greatest people, God. And because you know everything, we're not gonna sugarcoat this. Do not sugarcoat your sin. There's no reason to. God isn't somehow up there going, well, if they could remove one layer, I'll be able to see better. There's no layers. God sees your naked self emotionally. He sees it all, so there's no reason to kind of get ready, you know, get prepared to go before him where I can kind of seem like maybe I'm a little bit better than I am. Don't do that. It's a, it's a game that really is really dumb. It doesn't work. He's just like, just come before me and be very honest. Just be very honest. And especially if you've completely blown it, just no reason to sugarcoat it. I saw it. I knew it was going to happen. Like I knew it was going to happen before you were even born. And I kind of still sent my son to die on the cross for you. So like we're good. But just be honest with me. Quit faking it. And one of the hardest things is how we do that with each other. So it's really, it's really hard because we're always trying to image manage, you know. I'm, I'm trying to look really good in front of you, you know. And I want to tell you that I don't have any insecurities as a pastor so that you'd want to hopefully follow me and listen, you know. I've got problems. Like, I was waiting for my wife to be like, amen. <laughs> okay, and uh, she doesn't have as many problems, but she does too. So he looks at Israel and... Obviously, they're in this predicament because they're constantly just like going after idols. Goodness. I mean, we are, we are really stubborn because God has pretty much made an amazing case for himself. And you go outside and pretty good case for himself. Creation is awesome. You know, I mean, the background that, uh, what's his name in Utah? John. I, they look, they don't even look real to me. Like I've never seen such great manicured trees and grass and then, and then on top of it, mountains in the background. Whatever, John. <laughs> I mean, whatever, you know. So, you know, we, we do this constantly. We wake up sometimes or, or in the middle of the day and we're just like, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's, just, just to check God 
or this other thing that I kind of want to worship right now? Which one's better? Which? And so Nehemiah's like, you know, as a nation, we aren't that great. And he's just saying it. And then he's saying about his family too, like as a fam, we're not the best either. And then as myself, really not that great. So he's being really honest. And we should do that. We should. That's a spiritual thing. So we got factual, emotional. Then we got spiritual. Own up to the problem. And then we have the last thing. Um, but before we get there, I'm just going to say this. So many good things begin to happen when we choose to repent. I know that sometimes we think, well, I don't know. When I get really honest and when I repent, maybe that's when a really a lot of bad things are going to happen. Because God's going to be like, see, yes, now you see it. Now I'm going to get you. I got gotcha. you. Some of us like serve this gotcha God. And he's just like, come on. That's what you think the character of God is? I'm just waiting to show you that you don't measure up so that I can get you. That's not God. You know, he wants to catch us more than get us, you know. And then the last thing here is, is so then we have this problem. You have financial problems. You have relational problems. You, you, you have personal problems. You're, you're, you're discombobulated. We got to present the problem to the Lord. And, and that's what Nehemiah does. And that's, of course, through prayer. And, and of course, yeah, God already knows he does, but he wants us to... Man, he wants us to pour our hearts to him. He wants us to know that, man, we're depending upon you. I'm not praying to some other thing. I'm not putting my faith in the stock market. I am putting my hope, my trust in you, Lord. And, and when we pray, we're showing that we're aligning ourselves with him and with his power and with his attributes and with his awesomeness and his willingness to hear and deliver, you know? So the first thing that Nehemiah does is he praises him. I mean, how awesome would it be if tomorrow morning you wake up and before your feet land on the floor, you're like, Lord, a couple things here. First of all, thank you that I'm awake. I'm still here. But secondly is you are awesome. You're great. You're awesome. You're great. Now, we use these words a lot. We talk about this is great and, and uh, you know, and we, were, we were talking about Spider-Man in between things, right? right? Uh, what, hey, what are pastors talking about in between services? We talk about movies. And, and, but I didn't bring it up. But we were talking about Spider-Man really quick and I was like, so that, like, that's worth it to see it? And they're like, yeah, it's a good movie. I was like, cool, right? Or, or it's a great movie or it's an awesome ending. And we're like throwing out these words. That's okay. It's not the worst thing in the world. But who truly... Who truly understands or is what great is or what awesome is? So when there's lostness, when there's a problem, you gotta like remind yourself, he's really good. He's really great. He's really awesome. And, and, you know, and that's why worship you know, is fear. Um, that like walking down in your basement when you're a little kid, fear and afraid of the furnace. Because the furnace always went on, right? When you went down, it's like... Whoosh. And you're freaking out, right? I mean, that's happened to me all the time. And, but like when we fear something, we're afraid of something. You know, like let's say we're afraid of the mole. And what does fear do? It magnifies it. Who needs a magnified mole? No one wants a magnified mole. Keep the mole the way it is. We don't need it bigger. When we fear God, what does fear do? It magnifies. So it makes God, not, it doesn't make him bigger because he's as big as he's gonna get but it gives us the lenses to see how big he is. So when you fear someone, the fear of man, when you fear some news, when, it makes it really, really, really big. But we can fear God because God's awesome. God's great. And he's supposed to be really, 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 really big. Then the other thing that he does is he takes inventory of his attributes. You know, I, I've said that already, but it's, you know, you think about this. I mean, great, awesome, right? But it says though, um, is steadfast love. He keeps his commandment. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. He's the one who's faithful. Not you. Not me. He is. And then he recalls his promises. Look at uh, verse eight really quickly. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. It is an amazing thing that God is a covenant keeping God. He is a faithful God. 
And he loves it when people return to him. And so you have to know, remember the prodigal son? It's so great that he returned. Because what was the father doing? He wasn't working under the hood in his Ford. That would have been, been fine. It almost appears like he was watching and waiting and hoping. And then here his son comes. And then who runs to who? You guys know? Who ran? The father ran. And, you know, back in those days, and he was a dignified man, obviously, landowner and stuff, because the son was like, give me the money, which he's saying basically is, I want you dead. I'm out of here. So give me the money, basically, because that happens when he dies. But, he, but he's saying, I want you dead now, because I want all your cash. And the father runs to him, which is very undignified, because back in those days, they did not have great underwear. They, they, no, they just didn't. I mean, that, you have to know that. I know it sounds like, oh man, that guy sounds silly up there. No, no, you have to say that because it's, it makes the story even more rich. Here's this dignified father. And, and we have a son that's, that's, that's dating a, a girl that has some, you know, they got some money. Like the car they just bought, I think is almost more than our house. And it's funny, we always laugh, it's kind of cute because like whenever like maybe someone's gonna come to her house, she's always telling Seth what to wear. You know, we're just kind of laughing. We're like, oh. you know, like don't wear those shorts, wear some other shorts and everything. Very dignified. And yet he's just running, running, you know, and saying, I'll take the shame for you. So we got this covenant-keeping God who, you know, back in the day, you know, I don't know if you ever heard this saying, but it's like to cut a deal. Did you ever hear that? So back in the day, what they used to do is, you know, like let's say you and I are buying a house. What's your name? Jay. Jay? And I'm buying Jay's house. And back in the day now, I'm buying it for like whatever they would sell for back then, 500 bucks, let's just say. <laughs> and so, so we, we would take, we would take uh, uh, Jay's, one of Jay's pets that he has, and we would cut it in half, and, and basically the covenant would be, or the contract would be like, you walk through the pieces. And what you're saying is, if I don't make good on this deal, may that happen to me. So when God does this with Abram, they cut some animals in half. Who's the only one who walks through the animals? The Lord. Because only he could keep the promise. Abram couldn't. You can't. Only the covenant keeping God. He's faithful, not you. And so you know what your resume says? You know, when, when you go before the Lord and, and you feel really like you got a really bad, awful resume, the resume you're presenting to him is, I am bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Here. And he's like, that's right. That's right. So you don't need to come to me in shame. Or if you do, I got you. Or guilt, I got you. Or you're not feeling great or you're feeling lost, come to me. You, you, we, we, we get it so wrong. We think that we please him by being perfect and don't screw up. We please him by seeing him as he is. He's a gracious God and going to him as he is. Because he wants to get the glory for it all. If we're perfect, then who gets the glory? Not him. So then the last thing he does, he recalls his promises, but then he goes and he says this, because the walls were down, there's just discombobulation, but then he says, I'm gonna end with this, check this out, verse 11. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give, everyone say that word, starts with an S, success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Success is the favor of God. You're his daughter and his son. You don't think he wants to give you favor. Of course he does. So how weird, how weird would it have been if we saw in the gospels, this Messiah comes down, you know, finally, here's Jesus. And he comes down, but he's like the master of the obvious Messiah. So he's just walking around with these disciples. They're seeing blind people and deaf people and people that are possessed. And all he's saying to these people is, well, you know why you're like that? It's because we live in a fallen world. You know, 
know why you're deaf? It's because we live in a fallen world. You know why you have demon possessed? It's because we got demons and they exist and they're real. And, you know, be like, really? Like, what kind of Messiah are you? We could point that out ourselves. Instead, he comes. And with such divinity and power and hope, he's reversing all of the effects of sin wherever he goes. So I, I know not every blind person is going to be healed. I get that. And I know, I know, I know. But he's able. And he wants to. And when you look later on in the book of Nehemiah, man, it seemed bad. And somehow, probably because of God, it's an understatement. The walls get built, rebuilt, with opposition and everything. You know, they got like a Winchester in one hand, trying to relate to you Iowa people. (laughs) They got a 12-gauge Winchester in one hand, and they have a shovel in the other, or a hammer. And they rebuild the walls in 52 days. That's awesome. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that even when things are falling apart, Lord, that you're such a good God, we can trust you. You're faithful. You're faithful. So we lean on you. We don't lean on our faithfulness. We lean on you. You're good. You're great. You're amazing. And we just praise you for that. Let us call on you because you want us to. And you listen in Jesus' name, amen.